This week's lesson looks at the prophet Amos. Amos is primarily concerned with the northern kingdom of Israel and their lack of justice. This week, interestingly, Amos uses the image of what we may call a plumb bob or a plumb line. And in the prophecy that Amos has this week, uh, in using this plumb line, uh, it's important to understand how a plumb line is used. Uh, it's used to aid in construction to determine whether a wall uh, is indeed plumb uh, or straight or not. Uh, it's very often used in construction, but it can also be used in demolition to find a, a weak point. And so God is uh, telling the people of Israel that uh, he's determined the exact point that he is going to demolish and, and completely tear down everything. Um, it's not just a random uh, strike upon Israel. Indeed, God has uh, determined where he uh, intends to demolish uh, Israel and, and begin uh, the demolition. Now, the plumb line can really only say that in reality everything is plumb or not. It's exactly straight or it isn't. It's pretty much uh, a binary option. It, it either is or it isn't. It's not, well, it kind of looks straight. It is plumb or it isn't. God is telling Israel, the northern kingdom, that is entrenched in idolatry, that their solid look is only that looks. Yeah, it looks straight, and it looks solid, and their worship and their lives seem to be going pretty well. Now, the people are still naming their children with, with names about God, uh, with El and Yah, and they're going to worship service. They're going to, uh, to the sacrifices, so nothing on the surface seems different. And God says, you know, I've let you get by with what you have called straight, but I want to make sure that everything in the whole house, Judah and Israel alike, lines up. I've had plans for you, and I need to make sure that the house of Israel has straight walls. Why don't we check and make sure, let's use a plumb line. And as Amos reveals to the people, what do you know? The walls in Israel are not really straight. And as God has found this out and determined this, he realizes that, well, he's going to have to tear down that wall. He's going to have to rebuild it at a later time. Now, what's interesting is, is Amos tells this to the priest, the supposed messenger for God, the uh, intermediary for God. He tells us to Amaziah. Now, the name Amaziah means Yahweh, uh, or God, is mighty. Now, it comes from, from this word Yah that, that very often is, is used uh, in the Old Testament uh, as a shortened uh, form of, of the word God, uh, and it means uh, strength or, or uh, hardened or obstinate, stubborn which is exactly what uh, Amaziah has uh, become, uh, at least that part. He's not very godly, but he is very obstinate and strengthened in his own uh, ways, and he's very hardened and stubborn. Um, and yet he's appointed to lead the people to worship, quote-unquote, God. Amaziah is the priest in charge of the temple, and he's in charge of a temple of idolatry. He's a local guy at the house of God in Bethel who is in charge of leading idol worship. Now they're using all the right words uh, that they've learned as, as the people of, of the God of the Bible, but they're not actually worshiping that God. So Amaziah hears this prophecy about Israel from Amos, and he's worried because he knows that he's the priest of the national uh, house of worship. He knows that, and he knows that he's part of the Jewish people, and they're not really supposed to be worshiping these other gods. And he knows that there could be consequences, and that's what Amos is prophesying. And so rather than making the corrections, he tells Amos, get lost, go back to Judah. 
you know, they still worship uh, God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob down there. We're pretty good with worshiping uh, the, the, the cattle or Baal or uh, whatever false god we're going to worship this month. Um, rather than making changes, rather than just taking the, the conviction uh, and, and making changes, Amaziah is going to rationalize the idolatry instead of making those changes. And in fact, to go more to the point, Amaziah, still worried that Hamas might stick around and uh, continue in his prophecy, Amaziah goes to the king and he says to King Jeroboam, he says, you know, there's this prophet going around here in, in, in Israel. He's, he's, he's one of those uh, uh, guys from down there in, in Judah. And you know, they're, they're kind of backwards and, and they're kind of extreme. He says, you know, King, uh, this, this Amos has been prophesying. You'll never believe what he's prophesying. He, he said that God is going to destroy the line of Jeroboam. And so Amos, tw A Amaziah twists Amos's words. And rather than saying, you know, this is from God, he makes it sound as if Amos is making a death threat against the king. Um, and he, he basically convinces, um, uh, Jeroboam to, to ask the secret service to investigate Amos for treason. He's basically telling uh, Jeroboam and the entourage surrounding Jeroboam that Amos said he's going to come kill you because his God told him to. You know, he's kind of a, a, a wild person. We need to, to deal with him. And so we see in this passage, as Amos preaches prophecy, it is something that we learn through so many of the prophets in the Old Testament and even New Testament prophets like John the Baptist. Very often, prophets are going to come up against resistance. Resistance from those who have a stake in power and the system and the status quo. And they don't like to be called out on being part of this uh, system that oppresses everyone. Now, finding out what Amaziah is trying to do, Amos tries to defend himself and says, you know, um, I didn't really expect this. Um, I wasn't planning on being a prophet. Uh, and he tells Amaziah, he says, you know, I'd love to be back in, in Judah. I'd love to be taking care of uh, my sycamore trees and my sheep and back on my farm. But God called me to do this and well, I listened. Uh, you know, Amazon, I really didn't want to be a priest. I, I didn't go through all the training that you did and, and should know all the word of God and the law. I'd rather not have this prophecy. I'd rather not be doing it, but God called me to do it. And so I was willing to listen. So here's the prophecy. You do what you want with it, but just know this is what God has told me to say, and I'm going to say it. As Amos gives this prophecy to Israel, we're tempted to read this into our modern lenses. Um, underneath the prosperity of Israel and the lack of conflict for the people, uh, they've, they've forgotten God's commands to care for the poor, the defenseless, the little ones of the world. Amos prophesies that the court serves only the rich and powerful. The wealthy merchants are concerned only with their profit, and so they export, exploit the poor um, however they want. And so we read this and we go, well, other than everybody being peaceful and not having conflict, that pretty much sounds like us. Well, so what about us? What about our world? How does it look if we're put up against the standard of a plumb line of God? Well, we have our own issues. Um, First, we worship things, and we worship the people who have lots of things. We talk about, man, it would be great if all the uh, courthouses had the Ten Commandments in them so that everybody would know what the rules are. Well, what about the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not covet? Our economy is driven by creating desire. Although we benefited greatly from our economic system, its downside is it makes us want more. That what we have isn't enough and we need more of that. And even when we get that, it's still not enough because we've got to get the greatest, best, next thing. 
So we uh, are prone to coveting. We want what everybody else has. Second, we're afraid of the other. We think in terms of lawsuits and being harmed or being offended. And, you know, I'm all for making people accountable for their behavior. But we should also see everyone as children of God, that we are part of his creation, that we are loved and made in his image and all have a shared humanity. And so we should see everyone um, as brothers and sisters uh, in creation and not as threats. Lastly, our issues that we have to deal with is that we've forgotten to call it a sacrifice. What if we understood that we have more than what we need, let alone what we want? Um, why not take some of the excesses that we have and the blessings that we've been given and share it with others, even if it means that we feel a little bit of pain or, or sacrifice in doing so? What if we followed the lesson that we learned in kindergarten and share, right? We have to work on those things. We have to work on not wanting more and more and more. We have to work on treating others as being part of the same creation. And we should learn to share and sacrifice, um, even if we have to feel uh, a little bit of uh, pain when we do it. In doing so, we are reminded of the plumb line by which we are judged. And that plumb line is Jesus Christ. If we're judged by the plumb line that is Jesus Christ, we would have to admit that we're not always in plumb line. And if that's the case, we need to realign ourselves to that standard and become plumb and true and straightforward. Thankfully, we also can find grace from Jesus to straighten out our lives when we have been out of that plumb line. And remember, rather than bristling when we're called out, receive it and then work to correct ourselves so that we can walk uprightly um, in everything that we say and do and think and that we will be seen as straightforward and true as Jesus who has made us that way through his life, death, and resurrection. Amen.